so the 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 purpose of this talk is, as Anna said, is that to, to show you basically how how to do analysis, text analysis using Python and APIs. So I will also say a little bit about what an API is, since I was told that you couldn't assume everything that you knew everything in, in advance. So, uh, so I just start with uh, with uh, with the National Library then. So the National Library, how does well how how do you get texts? At first, how do the libraries get texts? So in Norway, it's with legal deposits, so that everyone who publishes something, newspaper or a book, you you have to deposit a copy at the library. So usually, libraries were either uh, otherwise they were uh, sort of private collections. So, at, uh, so it's uh, let's say the oldest library in Norway was based on private collections and not on these uh, legal deposits. <clears throat> so, um, so basically, the, the uh, so Norway is uh, fairly young. So it uh, was a, a nation in 1814. So that the, the first uh, legal deposit law from 1815. And so on, it was uh, removed and then reinstated again. But for the last hundred years, we had this steady flow of uh, books and uh, coming into the what was then the university library. So the national library is uh, is actually a new thing. So we'll look at this map. So there we see Riga here at the uh, lower right corner. There we have Oslo, and we have Moirana, which is the northern part of Norway. So in Moirana, we have all the storage. Oh, books, and in Oslo, there's sort of the old university library, which is turned into the National Library building. You can Google it if you want to look at the pictures, but you skip that here. So uh, now, so uh, all about the library first and foremost is storage, storage and preservation, and also renting out books, so you can order books from the library. That's sort of the basic function it has had done for the public li libraries. So I'll just uh, have a, bit, a little bit look before we go to the digital world. Just look at how uh, this, um, how the modern library looks like. So this uh, video is from YouTube. So it's the uh, the uh, the storage, the automated storage. It's like um, almost like an IKEA or uh, something. So you see, all the books are going on uh, conveyor belts coming in, and there are the robots that place books. So it's not like sort of you have the romantic notion of a library where you have shelves of books and you go and pick up, but that's no more. So the library is basically almost disappeared even before you get digital. So you have all these machines going back and forth, picking up books. And uh, so that would mean that the, the library is more like a barcode library. Everything is uh, controlled by uh, barcodes and uh, and databases. So if you just stop a little bit, you see that these boxes, they contain books and papers. And if you just scroll f forward a little bit, you can see how they're actually doing the scanning process of this. So that the book doesn't have a specific place, but it's scanned and connected to the storage place where it is. I'm not sure if, the, if you do the same thing here. So if you can nod if anyone and, uh, no, okay. So if we do this, do it the same thing here. But I think this is uh, probably the way that it uh, will be done with all the books. So that the National Library then, uh, if you order a book from the library or your local library, it will then send a request to the National Library. They will then start this process and the wagons going back and forth, and then you will get the book in your mail after a couple of days. So the next one is uh, the, um, the uh, digitization process itself. If we have the... Uh, just show you a little bit of the... Uh, where things are actually stored. So Moirana was chosen because of uh, the mountains. So it used to be an uh, iron uh, mining city. So here you can see actually the, uh, the room that we just saw, the, uh, the automated storage. And inside there we have then the mountain magazines of uh, where you store everything. 
So I was learning that uh, Latvia is the highest mountain, it's 300 meters high, so maybe it can also be suitable for storage. But I scroll, uh, so as Clemens told us, showed the pictures of the uh, digitization process, we go to 245 and then we can see the, uh, the digitization of newspapers. And you can actually see how the, the machines and so just one newspaper, you can see it takes a very long time. Right, so you have to do all this switching, so you can just do the calculation. So you said, well, how many years did you say? Uh, 1800. 1800 years. So if you look, at, if you take one paper at a time, you can just do the math yourself. You see, it will take take some time. Uh, just briefly stop it, since the the digit that you saw with the uh, with the newspapers was uh, the fast way of doing it. Since if you have a newspaper, let's say from the 19th century, then it's brittle, and then you have to do it more manual and slow. Uh, but this one was just doing a machine one. So for books, uh, show you also the digitize, uh, digitization for books. So you can see the machine there in the left uh, in here, which also takes some time. But this is actually the slow digitization. So if you have, you prepare the book, and the book is then being, uh, being, uh, kept afterwards, after digitization. But usually what happens is that uh, the, the books, they are being cut, they cut the back, and then you put it into a copy machine, and then you have scanned it, let's say, in a matter of uh, half a minute or something like that. It doesn't take any longer time than that. Okay. So that's the, the, the process of digitization. So once this has been digitized, so, so the, the process started in 2006. And uh, this year, we have finished all the digitization of all the printed books. The newspapers are still in the process. So it's around half a million book, books. And they are all ready for, uh, to be used, and they can be read online, most of them. But may, may usually either you have to be in the library, or you can also sit at home reading it, but you have to be in Norway unless it's freely available. And then it's 30,000 books that are freely available. But anyway, it's, most of it is in Norwegian anyway, so it's, yeah, it's only for Norwegians or if you study. So I just saw show you how the search for the bookshelf is. So then we slowly get into sort of the analytics part. So then uh, you need this a bit bigger. So then you have the search of the bookshelf. So I searched for the name Guy Boyg. It's uh, an author, uh, lived in the 19th century and up to the 20th. And then you get the list of the books that you see here. And then you can refine the search and so on. We won't go into that, but you can just click on a book and see how actually the reading experience is. So if you want, I don't think this is probably, I, I think, I, well, I, I would try to say that this is the world's best reading of digitized uh, papers. Uh, Clemens, you might uh, disagree. So, anyway. so if I click on this book, you can see that then I get into the book and my search term is now being yellow. And I can go in and uh, just scroll through. And this is also made so that you can easily read on, uh, on the mobile phone and enlarge and so on. And then you can scroll through and you can search in the book. But notice that, as Clement said, that we have these yellow markings there. So these are just pictures of the page. You don't see the text. And that's a clue, even though if this is, but this is freely available text, so you can download this text and do analysis on it, but most of the text you cannot do that. So um, we go back, so usually what you will see if I click on this one, show the uh, things that are not necessarily available. So this is what you usually will see when you search the library. So that it means that everything is just, yeah, well, now I'm in Latvia, I can't read anything. But if I would be in Norway, more of this would be available. So there was this, uh, because of copyright, the, uh, the availability of books up until 2000 can be read in Norway, if you are in Norway. Or otherwise, you have kind of a special permission. Or if you are at the library, then you can read uh, more. So, uh, so all this has to do with the lawmaking and the copyright issues, as Clemens were talking about, that we have uh, you cannot just make text available. So then the question is, well, how do you do analyze? You want to analyze a text that is under copyright. How do you do that? Or not just one text, but just analyze the language within, uh, within that. So that's the next question. 
So there we have the example. Okay, so but before we go, let me briefly recapitulate also what Clemens was talking about the uh, the actual uh, analysis or the the, the, the two-stage process of digitization. So one is that we have the we have um, the picture of a page. So there's a snippet there. So I have the word S K I K K E L E, which is uh, it's pronounced schickly. Maybe you know what it is. It's uh, if you speak Swedish, you probably know know it, but it means proper. And underneath there, you can see what the OCR software is outputting. So it's outputting an XML element, and it says, well, it has a string element, and you say it has these coordinates for the position. Oops, the position of the uh, the position of the um, of where the word starts and the vertical position on the page. So it starts 626 pixels inside and 900 pixels from above. And it has a width of 194. And if you do some math now, you can see that it's 200 is almost three. You can see that it's uh, the numbers stack up. And it has a certain height. And this uh, position and the height information is what is, uh, the software is using to do this yellow marking of the words. And I think it's the same thing that you had with uh, your also in the newspapers. And here, so as you can see, that we have the uh, the software. This is Abbey Find Reader, by the way. And you have the content, which is this word, inc including the punctuation mark. And you have this information here, which is the word confidence. So it's pretty confident about this word. And there's also an ad additional detailed confidence array here, if you want to look at that. So if you want to do the actual OCR programming, you would look at these uh, numbers here, and also can, then you can do also an evaluation of the quality. So for some of the books that we downloaded, we made available from the, the free available, we added uh, uh, averages of these word uh, confidences so that you can see immediately if a uh, book is, be, if the software is being confident that this is a good book or not. So we can use it for selecting books for further analysis, for example. Okay, so then the question is, how do you do analytics? How do you get to this word? So, uh, so what I want to is, I want to have this word. I don't want this picture, but I want this word. And I want to extract it, and let's count similar words, and so on. And this is uh, the topic for later today, how to actually do this programming. But then the question is, how do we do analytics on texts at all? So how do you get hold of the text? So let's briefly just uh, skip to a general problem that we'll also talk more about later today, which is um, web scraping. I believe that the teachers uh, of the Python course, are they here? Yes, so I think uh, you guys are doing web scraping, experts on that. But I had the project with, let's say, with Goodreads, which is the uh, place where, uh, uh, where I think it's the, uh, the Amazon uh, commentary place, right? So if you have, let's say, you want to, so you want to analyze. So if you look at this web page, so there's a lot of text there. And the question is, if I have this web page, so we have two problems. One is actually, if I have the web page, it's easy. I can extract the, the text from it. So scraping, using the HTML techniques and analyze the HTML page. But what you would like to do if you're a program is to just have a command, give me all the text all the commentaries of this book to kill a mockingbird. And the, uh, then the, prob the, the point is with, the, with the, this sense, you, you cannot do that. There's no way you can do it. So Goodreads has blocked, effectively we blocked the, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, uh, and you, there are some ways around it, but usually if you want to do it, you have to actually manually go here and click the next button to get the next set of, um, of user comments. So if I go to the, to the bottom here. Okay, there's also some videos. So you can see there are plenty of uh, pages from this one. So I have to go, so go to the next page. So in practice, what you are doing then in this case is actually doing a manual, manually going to the next page and store these pages until you have, let's say, 20, 30 pages. It takes about 10, 15 minutes. And then you have the data set and then you can extract the text from it. But what is nice is then to have sort of the access directly to the text. 
And as I stood for Clemens with the Europeana, what you have then is an API where you can say, give me that newspaper, and then that comes into your, uh, your program. So then uh, what we then have is uh, the HTTP, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Uh, are you all familiar with that? Yes? No? So it's the basic uh, working of the internet. So all programs, Google, when you do a Google search, so everything is, and the communication goes with this uh, protocol. And when you do the, uh, the, the, when you learn the Python, maybe are you going to into this uh, using requests and so on in uh, the Python? Yeah, okay. So we will learn about more about that uh, later. So I just skip this. But you have to just understand that there's some way that your, pro, your, your program will communicate with the internet, and uh, the Python has these ways of doing that easily. So that um, you get. So then we have two types of user interfaces. So for for um, for uh, you either has then a graphical user interface for the data. So what we did now in, in 2013, we're halfway in the digitization process, we counted all the words. So that's one way of making them available, right? So that, uh, so we counted all the words, all single words, bigrams and trigrams. So basically like the Google Ngram viewer. So have you, are you all familiar with the Google Ngram viewer? Yes? Some of you, some nods and some do, do not, so okay. So you can just Google it and then you will find it and you can search for trends. So here you can see the trend for the uh, two words. It's Riga and Latvia. And you can see something interesting in this graph. I will talk more about the actually the interpretation of these graphs. So this goes right into the heart of digital humanities. So when you create this data and you analyze the text, you get some data out, right? So what does that mean? What does it mean that you get this rise in the word Latvia around uh, 1990, right? So. Okay. So what you want is to get hold of the data. So the data itself might look like this. Okay, so just uh, briefly. So when you do uh, digital humanities, you have maybe three or four or two hats or one hat. So, so either you, are, you might be a librarian, you can be a researcher, you might be a programmer, and you can be a data analyst. So that's four hats. So usually when you're a researcher, you want to have the data in some form. And this is not the form you wanted it, but if you're a programmer, this is the form you want it, right? So you want this uh, graph here as numbers. Well, you can click on this download to download the data set, but what you want, you just ask for these numbers and you want to crunch them yourself. So if you click on this API search here, you can then see, then you get something like this. As there's a sequence of numbers, and if I enlarge this, you can see that, okay. So I have one key here, okay. I have to synchronize myself with the computer. So we have a key, it's Riga, so this is the word Riga, and it has a couple of values. So one value has, uh, is four, which is the actual uh, total number of um, occurrences of this word in 1812. And there's the relative frequency. So that means that you can, uh, when, you, when, you, when you're a programmer, you can then convert this into something that's more easily available for a researcher, which could be something like this. And then we get to the other part of this, uh, as Anna talked about, what we're using is the Jupyter Notebook, which is a Python environment for doing analysis. It's not just Python, but also R and uh, other languages. So that instead of having the graphical user interface as a user, let's say as a researcher, you will then write a command. So the command will then be, uh, is that readable? Can you read that? Uh, we can read it aloud. So it, the command is nbngram, and then you give it the parameters that you give in the uh, graphical user interface, but you give it as a text. So instead of having this, uh, these sliders and so on, so I enter Riga and Latvia as words, so add the smoothing parameter, and then I say I want the years from 1970 to 2000, and then I get this list. And this is actually readable. This is something you can use as a researcher. 
much better than the uh, if you look at this one. This didn't look nice. So, uh, but if you're a programmer, you take that structure and you convert it into something like this. Well, I just asked the uh, Python, uh, are you will really be talking about pandas yeah, at all? Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, 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 so yeah, okay, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So then, uh, so, so, yeah, and then you will learn about these data structures, which are very, very nice, so that most of the things that we deliver over the API will be come out as like that. So then you can process it further. So, um, and then, of course, you can then plot it. So I can uh, make this command, add the plot, and then you have both the data set, the numbers, and the plot and the visualization. And uh, so immediately we see that the visualization in itself also carries some information. It helps you actually interpret the data. So what's hard to see when you look at these numbers like this, I mean, I can't see anything from these numbers except that they are numbers. So I know what they are, but I can, but once I see this, I see this sudden strike top. Oh. Okay, so uh, once you have this example, you can just ask for, well, uh, the theory about n-grams and trend, trend lines. When, uh, for a word, when it uh, gets this um, high rise, it means something. So usually it will mean the meaning change and uh, well, well, usually it's meaning change, and so it means something before and something after. But here I think it's something else going on. But it also means that it shows you that how these data sort of point back to, to culture. So let's just look at uh, uh, f data from, from newspapers. So uh, when you do the n-gram, when you count the n-grams or the words, it doesn't matter much but if you have got wrong the layout, right? Uh, just counting the words, so they will be the same even if you have a perfect layout. So, uh, and of course, all the problems that Clemens were talking about uh, with newspapers, we, we have those. We feel them on the, uh, so. Okay, so look at this, uh, this one. This is for the uh, three, uh, three Baltic countries. So it's uh, Lit uh, Lithuania, Estland, and Latvia. So this is in the Norwegian discourse, right? So this is the Norwegian names for these countries. And this is a funny, <laughs> funny graph. So it, it shows you something. Something has happened around 1940 and around 1990. And probably we all know what it is. So we just need just one more word to see actually this. Uh, I was, this is actually a nice example of digital humanities, I think. Okay, so we just add Soviet Union. And then you can actually see that this graph is sort of wiping out the all mention of the Baltic countries from the 40s once Soviet Union came into place. And, and when it got dissolved, you get this rise. Why you get this skewness, I'm not sure about. That's uh, another topic, but uh, something with it's, uh, it's another story. But it's, uh, it's almost a perfect fit, right? So you see that how these uh, things go together. So. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so uh, when you, on the uh, notion of n-grams, so the other uh, thing you can do with n-grams is coordination graphs. So you have the, uh, so, oh, well, you wonder what an n-gram is, you know what, uh, don't have to explain that, I suppose. So we, can, we count for, so you, so you aggregate over a year, both for newspapers and, uh, and uh, books. So you say that you take a particular word like, uh, uh, the period sign or whatever, all the, the tokens, and uh, you count how much, how many times does it occur that year. So that's basically what you have. And also you can aggregate uh, together over the whole year so that you get a collection, so that you can say that uh, this particular word has a certain frequency in the whole corpus. And with the coordination graphs, this is what to do. So it can be used to analyze, for example, um, meaning. So what we have then is, uh, so th we know that in trigrams, so all words then, in, if you have a trigram, and we take, take all the trigrams with the word and in between. So in Norwegian, it would be the word og. If you had Latvian, that would be, yeah, some other word. Uh, the example I will use, since I, this will be with actual words, so in order for you to interpret it, I used, uh, we downloaded the, the Google Ngram and the trigrams from Google Ngram so that I can see the example from, uh, for English. But the same point is, uh, can be made for Norwegian. 
So the, 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 and also you will talk a little bit similar about this when you get to embeddings. So we will talk about, with them about embeddings on Friday, I think, or Thursday. Is he here? No? Oh, because he's on the program. What? There was... No, not yet. We'll okay, no, but it was on the, on the program, yeah. so the workshop, okay. So, the, so it, it's related. It's not exactly the same thing as embedding, but it's more intuitive. So that you can see that, well, we know that the word ice, and in same in Norwegian, is, and I think also uh, in, it means two things, two things, right? It can refer either to the sort of the, the, the glacier type that we have in the winter, and also it can be the dessert reading, right? So we want to see if, well, can we sort of separate these two meetings? using uh, the graph analysis. And that means that in Python then you can then just download or you get, you ask, so over the API you ask for all these, um, these coordination structures and then you get them into your computer and then you just analyze the, the graphs. So if you do that for ice then you get a graph like this. And then you can see that in the middle uh, there is uh, here, we can see that the word ice, and then you have uh, many words around it. And the colors then is connected to a clustering. So, uh, but this one, I'm not sure, are we, will you be able to talk about network X and graph analysis in Python? No, okay. No, ah, okay, yeah. <laughs> so, just, uh, so this is an example of what you can then do. So that the point with you as a researcher, what you then, uh, you have the problem described at a certain level. And then you can ask then for a command that will then uh, generate these graphs for you. And the command is very simple. It simply says make graph, make a graph out of this word. And then you can do look at the clustering. And the clustering is the interesting part. So from this graph structure, we can then do these clusters, which will then uh, highlight either what you call metonymy or uh, simple uh, no, polys uh, the polysemy of the word ice. So they can see we have this on the top. You can just read this and you see that we have um, like this. I'm not sure how to pronounce this, Frasil, but this is uh, ice that's being almost like a slush type within the big on in the sea. So maybe you have this in the Baltics a lot probably during the winter. And then we have the, the sleet and the snow meaning, so that uh, ice as a uh, kind of um, stuff. And then you have big chunks of ice like in icebergs, and then have slush again, which could then be, be grouped together with the other one. And then we have the dessert reading, sherbets and sorbets. So you see, these are then uh, extracted and then clustered out of the other one. So they go, don't go together with icebergs and so on, which is, uh, which is a nice feature of this, um, this, um, this method. But you also get these uh, associated meanings like crampons and axes, so for um, ice climbing, for example. I don't get this in uh, Norwegian, by the way, but for English we get uh, these uh, readings. So if I just go back again, so the reason what makes this is that we have, we do look at the coordination, so we get ice and slush is coordinated, right? And slush then is coordinated with, uh, let's say, with hail. But ice and ice is coordinated with sorbets, like it's served ice and sorbets at the, um, the dinner. And sorbets, again, is coordinated with fruits, but fruits is not coordinated with hail and slush, so that will give you sort of the structure that you need. So it's part of the an analysis of that one. So I, I think it's a nice uh, addition to, and uh, it can also be brought into the theory of embeddings and uh, this one. So the other one as a final example is you don't need to just analyze meanings, but you can analyze also place names. So we can use it also to, to help us disambiguate a place name, let's say, in, uh, in a text. So as Clemens talk, talked about name, name entity recognition, but let's say you have a couple of names in a text and you want to know what this place is referring to. So here I uh, added the uh, word for um, or they added the Riga, so I found that here. So in the top here, you have the word Riga, and it's connected and it's coordinated with different other words, which are then coordinated again, which then creates a graph and creates a structure that you can analyze. 
Now, Riga is uh, pretty unique, so uh, you don't get this illustration of the disambiguation, but there are plenty of, I think, plenty of place names even here in Latvia that are uh, multiple. Um, so if you analyze text, for example, and you want to know, well, which place is this? You want to do geotagging or something like that, then you need to have this uh, in order. And then you get uh, also a nice uh, grouping. So you get uh, the capitals of the Baltic cities or the Baltic countries. So this is Norwegian, but uh, no, not Norwegian. No, this is uh, yeah, this is from the Norwegian uh, data set. No, this is not the. So this is the librarian, uh, the library. So it's a combination of newspapers and books. So I just switched from the Google uh, to uh, the Norwegian. So the, I, I think you can read these place names even though they are the Norwegian spelling uh, conventions. So that you have Riga, Tallinn, Vilnius. And then you have um, also what is also interesting, I think, is that you get the countries coming out as sort of a separate part. They are not mixed together with the cities. They are sort of a separate. OK, so then we come to the texts. And uh, so one, once you do the, uh, the engrams, you are sort of free almost from uh, copyright issues. So I know that uh, Google, they, uh, in order to, to be quite sure, they put a limit on the uh, n-grams. So they cut the frequency of n-grams at 40. So if it has a frequency below 40, they wouldn't, it's not part of the Google n-gram. So we had something similar. We uh, added, uh, so in order to count for something to exist over a period of 200 years, we required that something occurred at least that many times. So, uh, but with text, it's different. So with the, with, when you have an actual text, the other problem, how do we make a text available without making the text available, right? So then we have the, uh, then we talk about the features instead. And also text are, uh, but before we do that, yeah, we have text are identified by a URN, a universal resource name. So at the library, I think also the, you didn't mention that, but uh, it's, uh, I think that is important for when you do research. So if you have, let's say, analysis of a group of texts, then you can say that, well, these texts are, they have this digital, digital universal identifier. So it means that this identifier connects to this particular text, which has that particular property. And so you can redo, let's say, if some researchers make a claim, like I make a claim about this Riga, you can just do, do uh, redo this and see, well, what has it done? And you can get the exact same data. So this is important. So that, uh, that's a problem sometimes when you create data sets yourself. There's no way that someone, uh, someone else can actually sort of prove that what you've done is correct or argue against you and so on. But I won't go into the structure, but I know that the, the National Library in Norway had this cooperation with the Finnish National Library about the, uh, the universal uh, resource names. So then uh, what you want is to build a corpus. So that if, uh, if you look at books, then you want to build a, a corpus by uh, adding a command which has certain parameters, so that we all know that the, the, the national bibliography contains a lot of information about the book. So, uh, so the, the book contains a set of words, so I, want, I might want to ask, give me uh, books that contains these words. Give me, a, give me all the books that contains the word Latvia, for example. Give me all the books that contains the words uh, love, for love, and so on. I want all the books by a particular author. I want books by title. I want the books by a subtitle. I want to have books by a certain language. So even though in Norway it's mostly Norwegian, there are some other languages, mostly English and Danish. And I want to have books that are translated from another language. So I tried to find books that are translated from Lat Latvian, but, uh, but there were none. In the, I couldn't find, not in, in my data set. And you also have the gender of the author, so you can then ask, for example, give me the books, uh, give me all the books written by male authors between 1960 and 1970. Give me all the books written by female authors within, let's say, nonfiction and fiction and so on. So we have all these um, 
different UI categories, and then you can compare and do all this kind of metadata analysis that also that I think Clemens that you had talked also a little bit, showed a couple of projects doing that. <coughs> But here is that when you as a researcher then you will then issue the command, it's called book URN, and then you can get those, a list of those uh, books. So here's an example of uh, a command. It's, uh, sorry, it's very small, but it doesn't matter much. So what we have then is first a command that will give me a corpus of all the books from the Dewey, oops, <laughs> so be careful not to click on this. Uh, so it's the Dewey category one, and I have a percent, I mean that it's from the Dewey 100. So how many of you are librarians? So, or let's, okay. so Dewey 100, what does that mean? Anyone have an idea? So Dewey has this philosophy and uh, psychology. So it's a category philosophy. And I say the subject should be postmodernism. That should be sort of the, sub the subject, where the subject heading of those texts should be postmodernism. And I want to add the period to be 1970 to 2020, and the limit is 300. Now, what I got, got from this one is actually 23 books. So it's not many, but 23 books. And then I can add another command, so, uh, which will then display some of these books. And then you can see then also the metadata. So you get also this first column is the URN. So here, since it's books, I only keep the uh, serial number of the URN. So, is it possible to read this? Can you read this number, anyone? If you not, I some nod, no, no one shaking. So, what it means is that the first four digits is the, the year that this book was digitized, and the next four is the month. So, this book was digitized in 2010, and the 16th of June, 2010. So, then you can read, even from this, you can read some metadata about the uh, and there's some number that indicate whether it's been digitized in Oslo or Moirana, but uh, I don't know about that. And then we get the author, the year, and so on. And we can see also say, one book here is translated from French, right? So you get all the data from here. Now, once you have, now we only have the metadata, so that references to the books. So the part of the process of doing, let's say, analysis of uh, text is then to get, so you can build your own corpus. So you have 500,000 books to build from, so you can build any corpus you like. But here we have a corpus consisting of 23 books and also one, um, one other one which I compare with, which is from the general uh, part of it. So it's, um, yeah, I'll come back to that. Now, the, the, what, what it, this means is that using the API, you can then construct objects that you will cons be constructing later today, I think, which is called the document uh, frequency matrix. And usually then uh, the way you're doing it is that you get the text on your computer and then you count the words and then you create that matrix. Now, instead with the API, and since you don't get the text, you can still construct that object, the document term matrix, and which will look like this. So then you uh, just, uh, so I put this, uh, I uh, got all the frequencies from all the, the words, it from all the, the 23 books, it takes approximately half a minute to download all the, uh, everything. And then you will get uh, the column wise of each book. So on the top of each column is then the, the book identifier. Downwards you will see then that the, uh, it's sorted by the most frequent to the lowest. And then you will see that uh, comma is the most frequent word or yeah, the token here. So that we use uh, that token. So that what we want to, to find out now is what is there more, since these other ones, these are Norwegian, so I will spare you from doing too much Norwegian uh, words, so that, but comma and period sign is uh, international. So we will compare uh, this corpus with another corpus taken from, um, uh, from also philosophy, but the logic texts. So we have 76 uh, logic texts, and I want to see if there's more use. Uh, there are people talking about post postmodernism. Are they using more commas than period, or is it the other way around? So then we can uh, find out something. But this command that you use, and it's, you put this uh, text into a variable called text1, which we'll learn about later today. 
And then uh, use this, uh, have commands that it helps you illustrate these numbers, since numbers are hard to read. I think so, but once you have this uh, coloring, it's easier. So I can see that uh, comma, for example, seems to be, yeah, it's 50-50 comma and period on uh, these first uh, six books. So if I, but if I do this the comparison, then, then then what you do is uh, just skip all these steps. But what you then then can do then it's uh, with the uh, when you have this uh, frame is to easily just add or do the average across each uh, row, and then you get the count for this group, which is the postmodern group, and I do the same for a logic group, and then I will get two columns. So for logic, I then do the average. It, it's uh, 2,800 uh, periods and 2,866 commas. So for logic, it's uh, the uh, the period sign is above the uh, comma sign. But for postmodern, you can see now then see that uh, this is as a lighter shade of green. Can you see that that it's a lighter? It's a bit lighter. And so there's uh, for the postmodern, it's uh, more the uh, it's quite a bit more commas than uh, than uh, the period. So it mean that's it. So that now the question is, you can you ask well when you have these APIs and you do these computations. So what computation is done on the server side? What kind of computation is done on your laptop? So you have a small laptop you download. So even just doing this is quite hard on the laptop. So you're pushing the limit on let's say a normal work laptop that you get let's say from the university or the library. It's uh, so, uh, but it, even though, the, let's say, if you have 70 or 100 books, it's easy, but if you get 2,000 books, it will start to complain very soon. So some of these uh, things you can do on the, on the server side. So you can ask, for example, uh, are you familiar with type token ratio? Things like that. So, it, so you can also ask to get the type token ratio for each book, and then you can compare, and so you can compare easy read books with more heavily read books and so on. And also these numbers, the period sign and the comma. So if you talk to lay people, they will say, oh, this is very, very boring. But it's actually very interesting, since it means that the comma, if you have more commas, it means that you have complex sentences. Since commas are usually introduced by having uh, subordinate clauses and so on. And if you have fewer period signs, it means that, well, it means that actually the sentences are longer and they are more commas, so it's more complex and more involved, right? So you actually can see into the text already. And then you can do with any text, right? So even though it's copyright, so no one can complain that you have broken any copyright law by doing this, right? So you just ask for the frequencies and then you work with them. Okay, one thing also that you do with uh, when you have a corpus course is that you talk about concordances and collocations. And um, so are you familiar with uh, what a concordance is, more or less? So a concordance is that the first concordances uh, were made a very long time ago. So this was for the Bible, so it's a kind of an index, and you have then a keyword and then a bit of a context of that keyword. And this is the, uh, the point where you might have a problem with the, the copyright laws. So that uh, what the lawyers at the library told me that well, I could at least have 12 words before and 12 words after, that's okay. And there's also a provision when you do this, uh, so um, it doesn't matter if you can't read it, but what you have then is the, uh, so here is the search for the word Kierkegaard. So it's a Danish philosopher. So on the left-hand side, you can see the list of the books. You can click on that book and get into the, uh, the National Library's uh, reading app and read the book if you want. But the one provision is that uh, the concurrence will never cross uh, paragraph boundary. So that if you download all the concurrences for a book, what the, the best thing you can sit with is a, is a bunch of arbitrary paragraphs. But you will not can reconstruct the book in any, in any way. So that's uh, a provision. So most of the security here is done on the server side, so that you can download these concurrences, but uh, but you cannot reconstruct the book. So otherwise, you could just reconstruct, let's say, 20 words and then just uh, uh, patch them up. So this is to prevent that. But another interesting thing is that what you can do then is um, uh, 
do the same thing with the collocation. So, um, so let me show an example of you do a collocation. So a collocation analysis, so I take a very simple view on collocation, so it's simply the word and you collect words from a context around. And depending on the context you choose, that will be the, the, the different types of uh, or questions that you ask. So if you're a linguist, for example, you might skip the left context, only the right context. So if you want to look, let's say, at the argument structure for verbs, you will say you have the verb in the left context. I don't care about what comes before. I'm only interested in, let's say, five words after and so on and do analysis on that. But if you want to do more semantics, and also there was uh, distribution semantics will be talked about later uh, on Thursday, I think. And um, so this is a, a way of doing this kind of, well, not necessarily semantics, but it's to create these objects that you use for distributional semantics. So if you look at this concordance, so what, what you now have is, so I take the word punk. So it's like in, uh, so this is the same in Norwegian as in Latvian, I guess, also in English. So it's the punk music. And now you can see that uh, once, uh, just looking at this, you can see that the word rock is actually part, part of this context of punk. So what you now can do is to make a collocation, we take all the words on the right-hand side and all the words on the left-hand side, and we can just add them together. And then you get sort of a synthetic text or you, what you call the word vector, the frequency type. Uh, but before you go to that, I have to show you also the engram viewer for the word punk. So this, uh, the, uh, the colleague of mine at the National Library, uh, Eva Eysia, is um, studying music, and uh, this is interesting. So anyone has an explanation for these two bumps? These are from newspapers. So books has also the same kind of uh, two bumps. So this one, the first bump is around 1980, and there's a second bump, bump then in 2010. So um, as you may know, the punk music came into fashion around the end of the 70s. So some of you know, none of you remember that, <laughs> no, but I remember it. So, uh, so, the, the, so there was a lot of writing in the newspapers about the punk music around 1980. And then wh what happens is that the, the kids, which were kids that were l listening to the punk music, let's say they were 16, 18 years old, and you go up, let's say, 20, 30 years, then they are in their 40s, 50s, and they start uh, remembering about the old days. And they are journalists and they write about this stuff in the newspapers. So they write about punk again. So that's the uh, explanation he had for, for this. But there's more to say about it, so we can actually learn something new by doing the analysis. So first of all, when you do the actual counting of the word punk, you get something that looks like the, the uh, well, not a postmodern text, but more like a logic text, right? So you get the same top frequency words there. So you have the, uh, the period on top, 2000, and then you have the comma, 1700, and then coordination and auxiliaries and so on. I won't go into how actually the processing this. I believe you, you, you will talk a little bit about mutual information and so on, or dividing. Uh, so, but, but very simple, what I take, I take this list and I divide it by the total list. So as I'm using as a reference corpus. So I compare this list to the reference corpus. And then, uh, then this comma and the period and all these so-called stoppers, they will disappear by themselves since they have the same distribution in almost all texts. So they won't count anything. So we can get sort of the important words. So we'll show you what the important, important words look like. After we talked about the command that you use, so in the Jupyter Notebook, in the Python, you just say, you, as a researcher then, if you want to use this tool and you want to analyze a particular word, you say, give this command. You say, cluster, and you give the word you want, want, and then you give the period. So this one, I, so I want to do, I run this twice. So one is around 1980. I want to see if there's a difference between the, disc, the punk discourse in 1980 and in 2010, right? So this is the, that's the goal. So I do this, uh, this command once for, um, for this period, 1975 to 85, so around the first bump. And I say that the ref, uh, so this is in newspapers, so I say uh, collect also 400 reference newspapers for this same period. 
And there's another parameter, say before, take 10 words before and take 10 words after. So we get fairly large context. And uh, once you do that, then the magic happens. <laughs> so, but if you're a programmer, you want to program this. But if you're not a programmer, you don't care. You are a researcher, then you just use this command and you get some result. And you do this once for, uh, for this, uh, this, what I call the 1980 period, and once for 2010 period. And then we get this. So I've sorted on the 1980 column. So I get a couple of words. So and not unexpected, once you do this magic with the division magic, you get rid of all the, the period, the commas, and you say that the most important words for in the 1980 is rock, new, wave, punk. So all these words I think you can read, even though this is Norwegian, but these are sort of the international music words. Uh, sex is not uh, sexual activity. Anyone know what, can guess what is sex with a capital letter is? Yeah, sex pistols, sorry. So that's the, but that's also disappearing in 2010. So we're not talking about Sex Pistols any longer. So they, uh, and also there's, uh, I took also this Tena. Anyone can guess what that is? Clemens can guess it probably for some reason. So it's, uh, no, it's, 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 it's newspapers. So you have uh, Tena, so you have, uh, these are boys. So I just say that Norwegian boys is good Tena. So it's with a double T, and it's usually being with hyphenated. So this is actually the end, uh, the plural marking of boys. So it's actually, in English, it's the, the S. So it's, um, and it's actually part of an OCR problem, which with hyphenations are not being recognized properly. So then this, the boys, then the ending is then coming up as, uh, as a word then from these papers. So I just can leave it there, so it's part of the noise that you have in, the, in your data. But otherwise, this is uh, quite uh, normal, and it's uh, what you expect. So we can tell you immediately that punk has to do with music, right? So even if you didn't know anything about punk, you would know that in music. Now we will sort by the uh, 2010 column and see if something happens. And then, yeah, because it, that's funny. So then we, get, we have rock, and then we get these two words, taqwa core and Islam which is actually quite interesting. Anyone uh, know about punk? What Taqwa Core is? So it's, a, it's an Islamic version of punk, at, and it's Taqwa Core is again, it's, a, it's an allusion to hardcore. So it's a Taqwa Core and it's an Islamic uh, punk uh, style music. I didn't know about that until I did this. So I actually doing digital mantis, you learn something new, get something unexpected. And you can also see that the word hardcore is part of it, but it's also part of the taqwa core. Uh, the word blending means uh, mixture. I'm not sure what that means, but otherwise we get these normal words like metal, pop, rock, and punk, which is had for the, when you sort it by the 1980 column. Okay, so the other thing you can do with, uh, with, um, with text, so, uh, so this clustering part is a lot of, so some of these uh, computations are done on the server side, so we didn't ask for the cluster, but not everything is done on the server side, a lot of it is also done on your laptop. So you just, it just you hide all the details of the computations. But uh, the other thing that is done in totally on the server side is that when you have a, a book, you want to see well, what kind of topics are in the book. Can I ask for, let's say, what kind of words go together? So there will also be uh, the talk on our course on the workshop on topic modeling. Oh, but that's was the same as the embedding, maybe. So is that unsure or? Well, I don't know about embedding. No, okay, yeah, well, yeah, but it will be a topic model. So this is, uh, so you can say that the, so clustering and co-occurrence is, uh, is, is one way also we're doing topic modeling. So let's just look at an example of that. So I take a particular book, it's called the Argumentation Theory, Language and the Philosophy of Science. And it's published in 2000. So this is the first front page. And I take the 100 most important words. And now you can interrupt me and say, well, how do you know what are the most important words? But you do the same thing as I did with punk. So I take the book, count the words, so, you ju so what you do then, basically what you can do on your laptop, you ask for, give me the frequency list from this book. 
And, you, and then you say, give me the top 50,000, 100,000 words in Norwegian, and then take this list and divide by that list, and whoops, you get the most important words. And uh, we won't look too closely to them since it's Norwegian, but then you see that then you take those words and you issue the command that sends to the computer and says, well, give me all the co-occurrences of these words in this book. And the co-occurrence is co-occurrence within the same paragraph. And then you get a, uh, a structure back, which you then can analyze just as we did with the, with the coordination graphs. And then you get something like this. So this is a topic modeling of a book for uh, assigned uh, to uh, first year students of uh, humanities or at the university. So usually philosophy and in this side. So then we have uh, one group topic, which is uh, theories. And, uh, and then you can see also there's some reference to Aristotle and Popper and Kuhn. So all these are uh, good names in uh, the philosophy of science. And then you get also, an, maybe you can also read some of these words in the Norwegian. So you have hypothesis and empirical. So we get uh, talking about the empiricism and so on. And then we get the philosophers and whether, so this is a topic of uh, sentences being true or false. And the last topic that you get from this one from the 100 most important words is uh, logical truth. So you get empiricism and logical truth and analytics in, in this, which is are the themes then in, in this book. Okay, so the, but the point is that if you, if you do this, uh, let's say for the Latvian, so when you have digitized them and, and as soon as you have so this is something you cannot do just by the, uh, the actual graph you cannot do on your laptop. You have to give, so you, you give the, the reference to the book, the URN, and you give a list of words, and you send them to the server, and you get this graph back. So the server is doing the analysis on the text. So which you otherwise, if you had the text, you would do that on your own uh, computer. So this is sort of the difference when using the API and doing copyright material. So the actual churning on the uh, text is done by on the server. So another example also that we do is uh, story arcs. So uh, yeah, this will be the last example and then we are, uh, I think, on time. So this is, uh, so one question is that well, what, was, what I was reading when I was a kid was these Western books, right? And there was a lot of fighting, shooting, and killing going on. So, so the question is, well, did it hurt me? But did I actually, is it dangerous to read these books for kids? So I took this, uh, uh, the idea of the story arc to say, so I count these words. So I have then uh, fight f uh, certain words for fighting and some words for happiness. So, I was, uh, so, so the question is, was this uh, protagonist, was he happy when he was fighting, or was he happy between fights? Okay, so what you do then now, so you have these fight words and the happy words, you don't uh, need to read the Norwegian, but you just get a couple of words that are associated with fighting, some words that are associated with happiness. And then you ask, the, then you send these words to the server and you say, well, count these words across, the linear across the book. So then you get a linear analysis of the book. So let's say while the, um, <coughs> the, the graphs were sort of uh, not linear, it's the whole book was compressed, there we get a linear analysis. So it's almost like reading the book, but here also you have the provision so that you can reconstruct the book, so you have to have a minimum 100 words count and so on. So once you do that, then I get this. And uh, so the blue lines are the uh, fighting, and the orange, now the orange is the fighting and the blue is the happiness. And then you can see that they get the happiness curve is this uh, out of phase with the fighting. So probably it didn't, I didn't take any damage from reading this, so he was happy when he was not fighting. So uh, not fighting is good, fighting is bad. So, right, okay, thank you. Question 
would you know what to do if you went to the National Library of Norway and we'll set the API and start working or <laughs> well, I assume there are some kind of guidelines how to use it, right, for anyone who wants to come in. Yeah, I could say a little bit about that. So we have the, these for the text. Now the, the engrams have been around for like five years now, but the text is uh, the last two years. And we had courses at the library. So we have courses for uh, social scientists, humanities, historians, and literary scholars. And even the statistical bureau in Norway is using this. So they're coordinating the uh, getting data from the newspapers and correlating, let's say, with the other statistics that you have. And the courses that we give, we have uh, around 100 people all together, and around 10, 15 of them are able to be productive using this, which is quite good, around 10%. So if you come, maybe, so usually you do this with the course, since this is so much in flux and development all the time that we, we don't have uh, much uh, in terms of, let's say, guidelines online. But you can, uh, but if you learn, if you are good at uh, with people, let's say if you have a master student, you know Python, you can just point to the GitHub repositories and uh, they are usually able to get going. But this is also part of, it's a kind of the hermeneutics of actually learning these things so that now you are exposed to what you can do, what kind of analysis you do, and the picture will gradually sort of mature. So, uh, right, and... Me? Yes, you Personally? Oh, it's, uh, I, well, I, you know, the, the story is quite funny since I used to use Prolog, so since I come from the 80s, right? So in the 80s, you wanted to build HAL, right? So uh, do you seen the movie, The Space Odyssey, with the computer HAL? So that was the goal in the 80s and the 90s, and then now we get sobering up and uh, we're not trying to do that anymore. No, so I was, I was actually doing, I, I, the, my problem was I was doing the counting, how to count all the engrams, to count words, how do I count words? And then Python was the script that was in vogue at that time. So Google had championed it, I think Google is part of, uh, and also it's a quite nice language. So I, uh, so once the Python 3 came, so we didn't have the problems with the Unicode and all these encodings. So it's just a problem also for Latvia, and I think it's the same here as you have in Norway. You have these special uh, characters, and so we have support for that, which is very important. And so I stuck with it. And uh, the other uh, program language I use now is also XQuery for XML, uh, which is very nice. So I use the uh, tool that's called BaseX. I don't know if you're aware of that, but it's, uh, it's very good. But Python, it's... Uh, so it's, uh, and, and the good thing with Python, you can write very fast code, so it's, but you don't implement important algorithms within Python, but someone has written something in C and compiled it into Python, so you can just, uh, so for example, in Python, you have, you will probably talk about the counter, the collections, yes, that's the counter, yeah. Counter, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, so, so I used the, so I found the counter and then everything was uh, easy. But, but, but also that uh, one thing with uh, having an API, so as Clemens also said, if you, if you download all the newspapers, you have quite a bit of work just counting, creating engrams. I mean, on the normal laptop, you cannot do it. So I had this large uh, server that doing counting and there's a lot of parallel processors and so on, but it gob gobbles up uh, just to count for one year or a 10 year period. It will take around, let's say, use, uh, something like 40, 50 gigabyte of your uh, RAM. So it's, uh, and if you have, let's say, uh, trigrams and so on, it, you, you need to have sort of lots of big, big uh, data machines.